à chaque fois, il rechargeait son, son fusil, puis il tirait, il tirait, il tirait. Je sais qu'il y a un mec qui tire avec un fusil dans tous les sens et les pompiers sont en train de réanimer, on ne sait pas, on ne sait pas. Ouais, franchement, on est sous choc. Quoi. At 9.30 on this fateful Monday morning, a sinister figure emerged from a parked car on Boulevard Beranger. Masked and armed with a deadly 22 caliber Winchester rifle, he struck fear into the hearts of those nearby. At 9.40, he claimed his first victim, a beloved teacher, felled by a single ruthless shot. The massacre continued as the gunman moved down Marceau Street, raining bullets down on a car and an innocent group of bystanders. Two more lives were claimed on the Jean Jerez Square. The assailant continued to fire indiscriminately before taking a moment's pause on the steps of the city hall. But the horror was far from over. The shooter went on to wound a policeman. Panic erupted as the sound of gunfire echoed through the streets. News of the attack spread like wildfire through the airwaves. It was a time of fear and uncertainty, just a few short weeks after the tragic events of September 11. And there, that is the World Trade Center, and we have unconfirmed reports this morning that a plane has The man continued his deadly journey on Boulevard Ertoulou, killing a fourth victim on the way. And the incredible thing about this story is it seems that he's choosing his victims. At one point he crosses paths with a young couple, students, a boy and a girl, in front of the university's greenhouse. They initially look at him, then more daringly they stare at him. They're only about three meters away from him, but he doesn't shoot. When he reaches the train station at 10 o'clock, he injures two police officers and takes refuge in the parking lot. The man screams, I want a plane to Kabul. After 9-11, what the hell were you thinking? A large scale operation is quickly put into place in the parking lot. Two police officers are hit by bullets in the chest. The killer is neutralized at 11 o'clock. In less than one hour and 30 minutes, the man with the 22 caliber rifle has killed four people and injured seven. It is a real massacre in the city of Tours. For the Tourango witnesses of the drama, the shock is profound. <laughs> My name is Gemma and this is Crime Dog and today I'm here to walk you through one of the most horrific mass shootings in French history. This doesn't happen that often here. We're not perfect, there are many, many, many killers, serial killers and psychopaths as you'll see from our channel. But when these mass shootings do happen, the long lasting effects ripple through the nation for years. Jean-Pierre Rue du Raffour, born on the 26th of April 1975 in Tours, France. On the surface may seem like an ordinary, unassuming man, but beneath that calm exterior lies a passion that consumes him. Du Raffour is an enthusiast of firearms, honing his skills at the shooting ranges and owning several firearms of his own. He may have a solitary nature, but that doesn't make him any less skilled in handling his weapons. It's said that he could have been an excellent sniper had he been given the chance. Du Raffour's life was plagued with with setbacks and frustrations, including a divorce in 1999 and homicidal impulses that led him to seek psychiatric help in 1993. We'll come back to that. This psychiatrist was tolerated for a rough total of 10 trips by Durafour. And on the fateful morning of October 29, 2001, after an argument with his son Fabien, Durafour took his rifle and headed to the city centre, unleashing a wave of terror that would shock the world. His children understand how dire this situation is, as they flee to their neighbour's house for safety in a moment of sheer panic. But their father is already in the heart of the city, armed and dangerous. Without warning, he takes aim and fires, striking Henry Casque, a respected school principal and loving father of three. Nobody is immune from his rampage as he shoots a retired man in the back, causing him to crumble in front of his horrified wife. The wife survives thanks to a stranger who bravely throws himself in front of her to absorb the impact of the bullet. Though wounded, the hero lives to tell the tale. The assailant's next target is Gilles Lambert, a 59-year-old man who was mercilessly taken out. Two more innocent bystanders are injured before the attacker storms the Tour 
Palace of Justice, where he shoots a police officer who was on duty and one who was en route to the building. Luckily, the second officer was only hit in the shoulder and did not succumb to his injuries. The attacker's fourth victim, Thierry Anguron, a 33-year-old father, is not so lucky. He is shot in the vicinity of the town hall and succumbs to his wounds. In a moment of panic, the attacker hides in the Vinci parking lot near the train station, hiding behind cars. Surrounded by police, he believes he is cornered and decides that he should try to take out as many officers as he can. The raid, the elite police force, is finally summoned to try and bring an end to the tour killing spree. One of the officers on the scene takes a shot to the thorax that finally neutralizes the attacker. The wounded man is taken to hospital where his delusions reach new heights. He spouts off a string of completely unbelievable statements, including expressing his support for Osama bin Laden. At other times, he declares that he is a soldier and that the Third World War has finally begun and he is constantly surrounded by enemies. In his final delusional outburst, he claims that the voice that commanded him to kill was that of his commanding officer from his military service years prior. His trial opens on the 16th of March, 2005. An exceptional trial with 10 days of hearings, 27 civil parties and about 20 lawyers. The room was full. You can imagine people wanted to see who this man was who had terror their city. He came to the hearing after about four years of sitting in a detention center waiting for his trial. Multiple tests were conducted on the suspect, delving into his mental and psychological state. His psychiatric evaluation was damning, revealing a psychotic, hysterical and paranoid personality. His ex-wife even claimed he heard voices. And Jean-Pierre de Refort believed that he was living through the Third World War ever since September 11. Despite this, experts testified that his ability to distinguish between right and wrong was still intact. It was soon uncovered that he had been playing the system all along. The man's sole motive was to dodge imprisonment. And after evaluations from three psychiatrists, it was confirmed that he was faking any and all symptoms of mental illness. In reality, he was entirely capable of understanding his actions and was not at all in a state of trance. If he had been, the realization of the horror of his deeds would have sent him spiraling into depression. But instead, he merely feigned amnesia. One of the psychiatrists went so far as to label the man as a megalomaniac, a liar who possessed high levels of immaturity. Others diagnosed him with paranoid tendencies as he perceived investigators and spies in every corner, constantly trying to harm him. His ex-wife, who had divorced him two years prior to the attack, confirms these claims in her testimony, recounting instances where he accused her of cheating and having relationships with multiple different men. All false. In her own words, he accused me of having relationships with men I didn't even know and even called my employer. She said she refused to enter into his delusions. She recounts the moment when she escaped from his dangerous grasp, revealing that she had to leave him because he had threatened her with a weapon. His paranoia had been palpable during the relationship, constantly monitoring her every move with a hidden recording device. It was all too much for her to bear, which is why she finally left taking the children with her. Their son, who was 16 at the time, echoes his mother's sentiments. He had had the confrontation with his father in the morning of the shooting, where he recalls his father ominously stating, there's going to be deaths. This is why he sought refuge with the neighbors, feeling scared for his safety. Contrarily, those who worked with the man described him as completely normal but solitary. He would eat alone and keep to himself. And although he never said hello or goodbye to anyone, he didn't demonstrate any signs of erratic behavior. When it came to the trial, Durafour claims amnesia, unable to explain his actions. Shockingly, he begins to position himself as a victim and failed to mention the real victims even once. Instead, he rambled on about his own suffering, citing his injuries and a hunger strike during his time in prison. The prosecutor, having enough, simply told him to shut up. If it's not to explain yourself, be quiet, you talk too much. That's what he said to him. Just before the trial, one of the largest judicial reconstructions ever held in France took place, with 80 people present, magistrates, lawyers, civil parties, and witnesses. And the killer himself, who continues to maintain that he has amnesia. He is present, he was asked to be there, and he is there. But he's useless since he has no memory of the devastation he'd caused. An officer who had been at the scene ends up reproducing the gestures of the crime in his place. The Attorney General will ask for a sentence of life behind bars, which is only fitting, given the heinous nature of Durafour's actions. The words of the Attorney General ring with conviction. I implore the verdict to show that the perpetrator's audacity will not be tolerated and to afford him ample time to reflect on his cowardice and the magnitude of his atrocities. Durafour's defence team will not end up arguing insanity as the trio of psychiatrists we had previously mentioned had already determined that Durafour was merely feigning his symptoms in an attempt to evade responsibility. Instead, they will argue that at the time of the crime, Durafour was operating 
considered and under severely impaired judgment. Despite this argument, life imprisonment will be sought by the prosecution, giving him a minimum sentence of 22 years in prison. Despite his promises to appeal, Durafour eventually abandoned this idea and accepts his fate. The tragedy of his actions echoed across the country, with even the President of the Republic, Jacques Chirac, sending a message of condolences to the residents of Tours. Jean-Pierre Rue Durafour could potentially ask for an appeal in 2023. That's this year for those of you who are watching this right now. So do you think this man could or should be free once again? Let me know in the comments. The question remains after two decades of incarceration, has his condition worsened or improved? The experts maintain that this decision lies with the parole board, not with them. The victims, however, remain uneasy. The horror that this man made these people feel mirrors the Mohammed Murat case in Toulouse, in which civilians were thrust into terror for days and days before Mohammed's reign would come to a dramatic end. Click here for more on that. I am very grateful that you're here with me today, so please do continue to take care of yourselves. Merci, à la prochaine, bisous.